Hello and welcome to this video where I will further demystify uh, agentic orchestration. We had a webinar a little while ago where we actually talked through uh, some sort of core details of how it works and how it runs. And I used this model actually, I ran it and I uh, executed it and talked through how it works. And we got a lot of questions, far too many to answer during the course of the webinar, which the link to is around this video somewhere. Um, so I thought I'd take some time just to really quickly run through the questions that we got and see how quickly I can answer them. So here we go. And for our first question, we talk about how the agent um, can be made sure that it doesn't go off and do random stuff on its own and how Comunda basically ensures that it, um, it, it follows strict paths. And it's really interesting. So I'll take this from a very high level and we'll work lower. The first thing is um, the agent the its its options are relatively limited. It's based on what it's able to do here. So, for example, the agent itself, the make the decision making component is this, and it has the ability to run whatever tools it wants, but it doesn't have the ability to go beyond that. For instance, if you take a look, for instance, at the uh, the task save to knowledge base. Now, this is within what we call the toolbox of the agent, right? So it's here for knowledge base here here and it's here, but they are built within a deterministic um, uh, uh, a pattern, which means the only tasks that the agent can actually choose to run are the very start ones, the ones that have no sequence flows going into them. So that means to run this, you first need to run this, right? Now the agent actually doesn't know this task even exists. It's only aware of this first one. So you can see that if we take Ask Financial Expert as an example, the agent can decide to trigger this, but once it does, it's hands off. Then we see that the the, the user here has the ability to, we have here a little uh, tick box that says, um, answer is stored in, in the knowledge base or to continue with Shearsmith. Now, what does that mean? It means the at that point, the agent no longer has control of what happens next in the process. Rather, it depends on the result of this input. And in some cases, you might end up actually saving um, that stuff in the knowledge base. Okay, great. But that's down to the user, not the AI agent. So that's one way of making sure you can build um, structures that make sure that once something is triggered, we have a deterministic flow that the agent has no control over. The next thing is actually about, uh, let's say, um, how does it make stuff up uh, from a, a lower level, like a variable level. And that's the really good example I have here is I have a, um, uh, a, a DMN table here. And this DMN table requires, um, let's say, user data, for instance, the date of birth, okay? And uh, this is the date of birth the customer should follow this format. This is the description that would give the AI agent. Now, this means the AI agent needs to give us date of birth. Now, why wouldn't it just make up a date of birth? Well, because in this particular case, I've uh, specified in the system prompt up here that it is not allowed invent anything about a customer themselves. It is told, try to use the tools available to find that information, never make it up. And I've specified just about the customer data because what I do want it to do is I want it to, to invent some data. For instance, here we have sending an email and you can see that here, this says the text of the email. I actually do want it to generate that. So what you can do is in the system prompt, you can actually specify the sort of stuff that it's allowed sort of have a bit of leeway on and the stuff it's absolutely not allowed to. And having run this model hundreds of times since that prompt was added, um, it has never made up customer data as far as I'm aware. It doesn't mean it can't, but it hasn't yet. So that's quite good. If you wanted to go further, what you could do is any time you could actually have a, a check that it actually says, I want to do this rules check. And you could actually, before that, first add an explicit query to get the user data and don't let the uh, agent even know the data is required. So there's lots of ways of dealing with that. So let's see what the next question is. Next question is, I keep getting pushback on trust. How do customers know that the AI can be trusted? Well, first of all, the AI can never be trusted 100%, but you have a really good oversight on what it's doing in both design time and in runtime. So let's talk about that. So in our model, we first see that we have the ability to make sure that everything the agent is able to do is 
visually built. Like it, it, we already have very st strict ways of making sure that it does things. And it can be trusted in the sense that within Commanda, you can have a complete understanding in design time what the model is capable of. Now, the key thing about trust is, of course, that we can then design in specific checks. And we see here that we also have the ability to, to uh, have a judge mechanism that will end up actually evaluating how successful it was. So in runtime, uh, it'll be able to do that. Now, in reality, how that works is if we go to a finished instance, the two things that we get here, here's a, a, an instance I ran a little while ago, and you can see that um, we have, uh, it ran seven times, so it ran seven loops before it was canceled. And we see that it sent out two emails, um, it asked an expert, it checked some customer knowledge base. And down here, we actually have the order in which all that happened. So you can trace back exactly what happened. And that's not by the agent, that's stored by the engine. So it can't be manipulated. You can absolutely trust that this is exactly what was executed. Now, the other thing is, why did it execute that? Well, for that, we have here the agent um, uh, the agent object, the, 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 the sort of the, it's, little workspace where it, where it uh, wrote down its chain of thought and decided for each tool. And you can read here that here's the text that came in and you can read its reasoning of exactly why it made certain choices and why it ran certain tools. This can give you a really good um, ability to tweak and understand why certain things happened the way they did. But also that same variable is what's used for the judging mechanism. So the judge can be trained specifically to look for those breaches of trust. And that's a really good way of making sure well, what the agent does is accomplished correctly and can be trusted. Are you exposing uh, personal information in the, uh, to our language models? If yes, do you ensure it's secure? Yeah, we do. So there's a few different ways in which data is maintained. The first way is, of course, that um, in runtime, we get long-term memory, which the agent does not know about, um, and we put that into the, into the context. So that's already two data sources. One is the context of the process instance running, and the second one is the actual long-term data store, where the information about the customer is used and it's not maintained by the engine or by Commanda, it's somewhere else. And that's brought into the process just for the purposes of execution. Now, right now, I've stored all of this as a, an object within the process engine while it runs, but you can also store all this information as a document. Um, uh, like a, a, a JSON object that's stored somewhere else that isn't even on the process layer. And so the engine would never have any access to personal data. The model itself kind of depends on you, right? So you can host this model and any information you pass it is still yours. Uh, but you can also make sure that the agent itself isn't given that personal information. You control the, the process instance has a bucket of data that it has access to. But what you put into the agent is up to you because you control the variables get passed into it. So in that case, let's say, imagine that we ran this with personal data. We could, we get the, we, um, we start our process. We then get the personal data from an external source. We mess around with it. We send some information back about that user. And in the end, then we basically scrub the, um, the process data. We keep something like the, the, the audit log, because that's not relevant, I won't have personal data, and then you're pretty safe, then you have uh, your, your data very nice and What is the library or connector type of these agents? Are they already available? They are already available, they're a connector that's there. There's two types of connectors I used in the, in the, in the process. The first was I used the AI, um, Gentic AI connector, which is how you connect to the LLM and how you add its system parameters and how you add the guardrails. And the second one is a vector database. Uh, this is this one here. And this is how I connect to long-term memory, both saving and, and storing. Both of these are available right now as uh, from 8.8 .8 alpha 4 onwards. And the final release will be in 8.8. .8. Uh, next question, can the AI model be trained in dev environments to review the following policies? Yes, absolutely, yeah. There's loads of ways of running that actually. For instance, like here we have the ability to, uh, we have an implement tab here, we also have a play tab. And in play, we can actually run this model um, in a more controlled environment. And this is a good place to work out whether tweaks to your um, agent have been successful or not. We see here we can start the process with an email and then continue the process. And this is a nice way to test to see if your models are working correctly before uh, putting them into um, uh, production. So yeah, absolutely.
Next question, can we write custom code to run the tool? Absolutely, it's no problem at all. Um, so I happen to be using a lot of connectors, but every connector started off as custom code. And if you wanted to, you could just um, have a service task here. And this service task links to any other system. You see, any other service or uh, or system you want. Here we have a job type, for instance. This is how it functions. It basically creates a job type called, let's say, do uh, important work. And then your custom code, um, in whatever language it is, essentially uses an API to register for that event. When that event happens, your custom code will get the context of the process, will be able to execute something and then send something back asynchronously through, uh, through processing. So this could be, this could be any code you want. Um, if you want to make it a little easier, you can also just use a REST connector, and this just makes a REST call, so you can communicate direct to, directly to another system. Okay, next question. Please explain how subprocess in the fraud detection block of the agent-enabled uh, processes are selected. I can understand how they might act be activated. Great question, and let me explain. So if we start off with the, the agent itself, so the brains of the outfit is right here, and the tools are down here. So how are they connected? Well, first, the pretty obvious way is that we have a tool section down here, right? And the and we this is has an ID, and that ID called fraud detection tools is the ID of this sub process. So that's the first way. It's first then connected to this. So what actually happens is when we start the process and the token arrives here, it then says, "Okay, I have all these tool uh, this toolbox. What are my tools?" And it has a basically it has some code that runs that runs through this sub process and looks for every single task or event that does not have a sequence flow going into it. And for each of those, there is this. And this set, this is a natural language description of what this tool is for. So this says that it's an element documentation. Use this activity to reply to an end user uh, to get clarification. So this is why the agent might use this. And we also have something similar down here where we have our DMN tables. And we have, and this is a rule rules table that um, uh, takes specific variables and checks if a customer is a top customer or not. So this is. So then, therefore, when it starts, it gets all of these um, natural language descriptions of the tools, and so that helps it decide how to use it. The next step then would be, well, let's say, for instance, this DMN table, what's required? And you'll see here that one of the things that's required is, um, let's say, a date of birth. And for, for every input, we also describe it. So we see here that this shows uh, a natural language description of this is a date of birth of the customer, it should be in the following format, and it's a string. Okay, so this then describes exactly which variable, and this is done for each variable that's necessary. Not all variables are needed to be created uh, by the agent. For instance, here we have an email um, uh, sending. We have here the email content, but what we don't want the agent to do is come up with the email address themselves. We already have that in the context, so we'll just use that directly. We don't need to use that. So yeah, that's how it decides. It basically arrives, it checks all the tools, it reads what they're for. If it selects one, it reads what variables are required. It then checks if it has the variables, and if it does, it tries to activate the tool, or it'll try to run one of the other tools that would give it the variables needed. So yeah, it can often think about three or four steps ahead. Next question, how many developers do you need for a solution? Really depends. Uh, the, this example here um, is not difficult for a developer to build. The things that are kind of difficult uh, might be the actual individual tasks in here and getting those set up and building those, depending on what they are. But in general, there's not a huge amount of work here. Uh, this example took me uh, maybe three or four hours to build, I think. I can't remember exactly how long, but it was less than a day. Um, and uh, it's mostly just making sure that everything is integrated correctly. It's not a very complicated thing to do. Uh, okay, next question. How do you connect agents with an existing oper uh, operational system that users work with or operating systems could be throw away when using this approach? Um, so it's kind of whatever you'd like. You can think of this as, a, as more of a back end than a front end. While it is totally visual, what the user sees can be uh, a front end that is like on a website somewhere uh, that then that then we can communicate to via API, or it could be a, uh, a an app like a chatbot that is in the background asking uh, the AI agent for uh, to do some work, and then it comes back with a response. There's lots of ways of implementing this. The front end and how the user perceives it usually 
Visually, they shouldn't really need to see any of this stuff here. You can decide what that is. You can also be uh, omnichannel, so you could have the same agent being used in multiple different front ends. So it's uh, it's it's quite it's quite up to you actually, depending on how you um, want to integrate. How do you ensure item potency? There's lots of ways of doing that. It kind of depends on on. on um, how you want to achieve item potency so for instance if you only want one customer to be uh, like a customer to be dealing with a single uh, input at a time it's really really simple you could run a check at the very very beginning when you get the long-term memory you could like set a lock saying i'm dealing with this customer and then the next time it runs if the same customer says another email um let's say to uh, with a similar question the, um, externally we can validate that it's something already running um, and then it will just um, not respond or end the process. There's a lot of ways of ensuring item potency. It really depends on um, exactly what that might mean to you. But you can either model it, you can use data to create locks. Um, uh, yeah, and then you can uh, deal with it if we already like, either by ending the process or send them an email saying we're already dealing with this somewhere else. So yeah, it's up to you. Next question, is there additional training of the LLM needed to special industry use cases? I would say there should be. Um, I didn't use it. So for instance, for this, this is a very specific use case. It's down to a financial institution that needs help. But so I needed to do a lot of work inside of the system prompt in here. To, to give it way more context about the kind of um, uh, place it works, the kind of stuff it needs to do, um, defining uh, rules around and regulations. This is all done by me in a system prompt only because this is a generic LLM. Ideally, you really would have a better trained LLM that already has that going forward and that makes it much easier um, for uh, to maintain but you don't have to. Um, our tests kind of show that we can use quite generic uh, models in most cases um, uh, and and just so sort of, and help it along with system prompt. But ideally, you really should have a model that's trained to understand its context better. It just built in the long run will just perform better. And our final question, if I give very personal information, how rich I am, how are you making sure whether this information is stored? Well, as I said, the information is already stored uh, in the engine, but it actually can be either removed or over the course of the engine, we'll be offering the ability to store that information in a document that's external that, the, that no one can see. Um, so yeah, it's really easy. You get to decide how the information runs. Only during the lifetime of the process is the data actually needed. From that point on, the engine itself can remove it and that where that information came from, some external source, it can be maintained there. The engine does not need this data for very long or in some cases may not need it at all. It could be a case where the agent isn't allowed to get that data, which is perfectly reasonable. It should only be allowed to get data it really needs. So yeah, it's kind of up to you and how much access you give that. Okay, so yes, that is all the questions I will answer. Everything else has just one little upvote, which is very, very small. So um, I will have to leave it for now, but thank you very much. I hope that was useful. And uh, please reach out if you have any more questions. Goodbye.